darkness, my old friend. I've Please come to talk with you again. And stand to the right. Mike Nichols' 1967 film adaptation of The Graduate tells the story of Benjamin Braddock, a 20-year-old that has just finished college and returns home for the summer to his parents' house in California. He is awkward, he is clumsy, and he's a little worried about his future. But most importantly, Ben is alone. You're watching Screen View Mirror. I'm your host, Emma, and this is my take on The Graduate. Now, every film has a turning point, a spark, a sequence or course of events that define the whole story. Today, I want to look at the pivotal point of The Graduate, the pool scene birthday sequence that kind of sets the whole plot in motion and makes this film into what it is, an expression of post-protagonism in an age of plastics. There's a great future in plastics. Note that Ben is the only 20-something at his own party, much like at the graduation party a few scenes earlier. This is all happening at the very start of the film. I think that at this point we understand that the parties his parents throw for him are not actually for him. They're just about him. You're disappointing them, Ben. You're disappointing them. Dad, can you listen? Let's not give you 10 seconds. He is going to give us a practical demonstration of what I feel safe in saying is a pretty exciting birthday present. <laughs> and it better work, or I'm out over 200 bucks. Okay, then, let's hear it now for Benjamin Braddock! Yay! Come on, Benji! Come on, Benji! Let's hear it now! That a boy! The staging here can be likened to that of a circus or a theater. You have the host of the show, Ben's father, the spectators, his parents' friends, and Ben himself, the feature attraction, waiting behind the curtain to come out onto the stage. Ben finds it difficult that his parents have reduced him to a mere performance, and Nichols captures this through the camera's framing. In this sequence, we see, hear, and ultimately feel Ben's point of view. He then plops into the water, and the camera slowly tracks backward, exiting from Ben's original POV. This gives us a visual representation of how it feels to be drowned by others' expectations, stuck in your own story. Indeed, this scene is what drives Ben to the pitfall of his existential crisis. I was thinking about that time after the party. Where are you? And I was wondering if I could buy you a drink or something. Where are you? Uh, the Taft Hotel. Did you get a room? No. Now, I know it's pretty late, and if you'd rather... Give me an hour. What? I'll be there in an hour. The J-cut of him calling Mrs. Robinson alone, outside, in the dark, serves as the explanation for his nihilistic judgment when he decides to accept what he previously thought would have been an unthinkable offer to even acknowledge. It's as if Ben is Sisyphus, who suddenly decides to abandon his rock. Instead of toiling in what he feels is an empty, mundane, and silent existence, Ben decides to exhaust the limits of whatever else is possible. Perhaps he has reached a state of meta-nihilism and thinks that something different, that anything different, could be good for him. Why? Well, it's very comfortable just to drift here. Have you thought about graduate school? No. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. When watching the movie, it's hard to judge Ben as necessarily good or bad. I think the best we can do is see him as a post-protagonist with writer's block. Except what he's trying to write is not a book, but rather it's his future, his life story. What are you doing with yourself these days? Oh, not too much. Taking it easy. <laughs> That's what I'd do if I could. Nothing wrong with that. And this is why The Graduate is seen as a coming-of-age story. It's because Ben is trying to become the subject of his own novel. Because he's trying to give and to take perspective. Ben is trying to grow up. So ultimately, 
It's okay to refuse to play Sisyphus and feel compelled to chase something different. These choices are all fine as long as you understand your motivation behind them. As long as you don't become nihilistic and refuse the will to find yourself when you are indeed lost. Yet Ben does not understand his motivations. He does not stop to ask why he's doing what he's doing. He does not know whether he is good or bad, and so he cannot identify the validity of his choices. Therefore, Ben is just a post-protagonist, blinded by darkness and falling deeper into uncertainty. The way Ben feels about his future captures the overall existentialist anxieties of young adults in 1960s America. Uncertain about what was to come, they explored themselves and the world around them through psychedelia and political activism, creating their own generation, distinct to that of their parents. But as much as we like to think that this was a decade of change, the Vietnam War and the proliferation of plastics essentially continued the status quo of destruction and consumerism. If anything, violence and materialism existed before the 60s just as much as they persist to this day. Although the counterculture questioned the status quo, no one had effectively replaced it. Now, this doesn't make 60s youth good or bad. It just makes them post-protagonists in an age of plastics, who simply passed down their existentialist anxieties onto future generations of Benjamin Braddocks. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, this was my first ever video essay. I really liked doing it, and I will see you next week. This was Screenview Mirror.